Good afternoon, everyone. We're so grateful that you're here joining us um, today. Uh, a few quick reminders, all of our uh, sessions are recorded and they will be available on Hubelo um, next week through the end of October and then on the CSHJ website after that, recordings and slides. And feel free to participate in the chat and Q&A and um, as you can see on, on your screen here, join the poll everywhere. Um, the presenters will get to the Q&A at the end. Uh, don't also remember that there will be evaluations um, that uh, if you fill out, you will be entered into a raffle. So remember to complete um, your raffles at the end of each day. Um, and thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna pass it over to our team of presenters for healing centered schools, healing centered school strategies for implementing school-wide trauma-informed practices. Hi everyone, um, I'm Vanessa, I'm the clinic supervisor at Roosevelt Health Center in Oakland. Um, we're really excited to have you here today. Um, we're joined by two of our teachers from Roosevelt, um, as well as our IBH, our integrated behavioral health clinician, Sarah Taylor. Um, and we actually come from two schools, Roosevelt Middle School and Havens Court Middle School. Um, so please, as Jessica said, Join the poll everywhere, um, help participate, um, and let us know your thoughts. Sarah? Yeah, hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, we're really glad to be here. I wish we could be in person, but we're gonna do our best to um, participate as a community from afar. And yeah, I'm a mental health clinician on the Havens Court campus at CCPA, um, which is a middle and high school, um, and also have worked over at at Roosevelt with the lovely folks on your screen. Um, and we're talking today about what it means to create a healing centered school and classrooms um, and what that process has been. Specifically, we'll talk about um, some grant funded work that took place on the Roosevelt campus and where we started and, and where it's going. Um, yeah, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, like Nessa said, we'll be leaving some room for question and answer at the end. So if something comes up for you and you want an answer, feel free to drop it in the um, question box and we'll get to them at the end. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Nessa, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass it over okay. to you. Great. Um, again, we're sharing on healing centered schools today um, and hopefully I'm going to share some strategies for you all um, on how to implement school wide trauma informed practices. Um, so our goal uh, with this work has been to build community connection and resilience um, and to do this, um, we focused on building relationships that support growth and encourage resilience in young people by fostering connections and strengthening community. Um, in order to do this, we focused our energy on three groups. Um, as you can see, educators, families, um, and students. And I just wanted to start off by saying that um, this work is very, very important to me um, because I actually grew up just a few blocks from where Roosevelt Health Center is. Um, in East Oakland. And as a young person growing up in that community, um, I totally get and see what our kids are going through. Um, and they experience a lot on a day to day basis. Um, I myself experienced like a tremendous amount of trauma in the community from police brutality, uh, to community violence and losing friends at a really young age, um, and all the things in between. Um, so that being said, um, our students really need all the love and support they can get um, in order to start healing, to start their healing process, um, as well as for the community to start heal healing. Um, so that being said, as you are participating today, um, think about these th three groups. Think about um, your own school and who is included in these three groups, um, educators, families, community, and students. Um, who's left out, uh, and what assets and opportunities exist in each group. Um, when there is genuine investment, 
resilience work becomes an integrated piece of school culture. Um, how did we get here? Obviously our students, um, and before passing it off to Sarah uh, to talk more about how we started this work, um, I just wanted to honor our students. Um, a lot of us have not been able to see our kids and interact with them in the ways that we typically do because of distance learning and all the virtual things that are, are going on. Um, and in preparation for this presentation, I spent a lot of time thinking about our young people um, and what they need right now, what they're experiencing right now, um, and what they're missing. Um, school is, as we know um, from working with young people, school is often their safe haven where they come to uh, connect with other people, play with their friends, they get to have consistent adults in their lives. Um, who show up for them day in and day out and give them undivided attention. And so um, I just want to honor them um, and acknowledge them as a reason, a huge reason why we're here. Uh, so Sarah, uh, please. Yeah, so um, uh, we started, I mean, this work has been ongoing for a long time, but several years ago, um, Roosevelt Health Center, the health center over at Roosevelt was given a grant um, a, a big grant to work on um, creating trauma in a trauma informed school. And so we're going to unpack a little bit about what that means, what that looks like. Um, really want to, like Nessa said, honor um, the students who have been here with, with us and inform this work. Um, and so we'll be pulling in some of their quotes um, throughout. And these are our direct quotes from some of our students who've given us permission to share in trainings. Um, and one of our now ninth graders this is when they were in middle school said, I wish teachers at middle school would know that even though I failed most of their classes, I was doing a lot of healing. Like I went through hella stuff in middle school that girls shouldn't ever have to go through. And it really messed me up. I had anxiety all the time. Sometimes when I was really anxious, I would just leave the class or be rude to them. What they didn't know was that school didn't matter to me because it couldn't matter to me. I was too busy trying to stay alive and not lose my mind. But now I'm going to mom my classes. I'm not getting straight A's, but I'm for sure going to graduate. So tell them even the kids they think aren't going, getting anything from them probably are. So where we came from. So our first year, we were given this huge grant and I was one of the point people were kind of told, okay, like create a trauma informed school. And so what does that mean? Um, and really the first year was all about relationships. That was my first year at Roosevelt. There was a lot of new staff that year. Um, and it was really about building relationships, identifying strengths and taking the temperature. We didn't wanna just jump in with solutions without understanding the, the strengths and the opportunities that existed and without understanding and having connections with the people that this was actually going to impact. Um, so then that second year we began to strategize we did assessments, both formal and informal, um, kind of prototype, tried some things out, looked look to see what worked and didn't work. In the third year, um, by that time, we'd gotten an additional grant. And so we were able to um, do a cohort um, to kind of build up uh, the skills and strategies that educators and admin and support staff um, could use. And also for them to have a space to be in community with one another um, outside of their classrooms. Um, we began implementing some of the recommendations that came out from that process into practice and policy. We reassessed, we prioritized for the next year. And then um, Nessa, Whitney and Audrey will talk a little bit more about what happened after that because I moved over to a different school, but um, really a focus on sustainability. And we went from having a lot of this work led by the health center to trying to make it so that it was really led by the educators um, and admin on school. So first, um, an assessment. Um, I don't want to downplay the importance. I'm going to say relationships a lot. I think particularly most of us on this um, at this conference are working inside of health centers um, on campuses, right? And so a lot of times we can feel a bit siloed and that informal information gathering and um, relationship building is foundational to this work. And so a lot of the assessment that we did or that I did was walking the halls and the blacktop, like stopping and sitting with students on the grass, 
stopping into teachers' classrooms to say hi or ask them if they needed a cup of coffee, um, kind of reading the room to identify what was going on. Um, also, we did use something called um, through SHAPE, the TRSIA, which is the Trauma Responsive Schools Implementation Assessment that's linked if you look at this presentation later, it's linked in the slide. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that. And then just trial and error. So this was an iterative process. We tried things, we, we looked to see if they worked, we saw what that response was, and then we changed, think, we changed course um, multiple times along the way. So when we were originally given the grant, we um, initially, I think the thought was, the thought from admin and the health center was initially, okay, like we really should focus on um, like tr targeted trauma-informed programming. We should really focus on making sure we have like strategies in place for students. And what we found um, when we did this assessment and we did it across um, disciplines. So rather than just having people at a cost team filling it out, we incentivized it so that we could get as much participation as possible from folks in classrooms, educators, paraprofessionals, um, school security, um, administrators, and some students to fill it out. And what came out of it is that actually um, our major areas where these X's are that needed some attention was our trauma programming school-wide classroom strategies. Teachers were saying like, yeah, I, I understand what trauma is. We've been getting these trainings for years. What do I do with that in my classroom? And then um, really looking at staff self-care and recognizing the impacts of vicarious trauma and um, just having like an insurmountable amount of responsibility and all these different um, priority being pulled and teachers are being pulled in a bunch of different directions without an actual space to care for themselves and care for one another. So that's where we focused. And so we use that to inform a lot of our work. So we first started with educators. Um, a lot of times when we talk about trauma work, the focus goes to what can we do for our students? What can we do for our families? And those things are really important and also, if our educators who are the people who are with our students, um, a majority of the time, they're spending so many hours with students, they have so much um, buy in and relationships with students, they're the people that the students see day in and day out, they might see me for 30 minutes to an hour a week, but they see their teachers every day. Um, and so we really wanted to focus on our educators as being the heart of this work. Um, if educators do not have strategies for self-soothing and for self-care, if the structures in place are creating a toxic environment in which educators can't access those things, if educators don't have um, spaces where they're able to connect with, with their colleagues and with their, their friends um, outside of like a crisis like situation, then we're not going to be creating a trauma-informed environment. It will not be possible. And so for the first year or two of the grant, we focused entirely outside of what was already happening in the health center with trauma therapy. Um, we focused entirely on educator wellness. Um, we started with doing teacher breakfasts, really informal. Teachers did not need another thing to check off their list. They did not need to go to another 30 minute training that didn't actually have any strategies attached to it so that they could sign in on a piece of paper. They needed spaces where they could feel nourished, um, both like literally nourished and also have a space to connect with other people in this community that was not, um, not so formal and structured and this top-down situation. Um, so we did that, we focused on, we created a staff wellness lounge, um, it, which was originally kind of like, it was a space in the school that was like a dumping ground for everything that had broken. <laughs> So I don't know how things got there were like broken copy machines and like old desks and like a chair that didn't work. And that was supposed to be the space that teachers came to like start their day and make their coffee and have their lunch break. And I don't really know how any of us could function in that type of environment. And it also says a lot about how we value um, our educators and the people who are working in our schools when we don't have spaces for them to feel like restored and connected. 
Um, so we did a lot, a lot of that. Um, we did some like process groups. We did some one-on-one um, -on -one consultations with teachers. And then we also um, started the Healing Centered Schools cohort, which I'll talk about. Um, yeah, I think we can go past that. So these are some of the strategies that we implemented first. Um, in that second year um, in classroom strategies, so we're focused first on educator wellness, making sure we had some things in place to support that work. And then we built on top of that the classroom strategies. So the first time, first year that we did this, we focused a lot on um, calm corners and funding those. So giving educators, um, again, some choice and empowerment to, to make their spaces theirs and also to get um, input from students. And so we were able to fund those um, and also train teachers in um, how to implement them. Um, we use standing professional development time for trauma-focused training where educators got to choose. Um, there were like three different um, kind of things that they could choose each time. So maybe they needed case consultation. Um, maybe they had a really specific student issue they wanted to work on. Maybe they wanted a really didactic training um, they go back and forth and maybe they just wanted someone to present to them and they didn't want to like participate um, in that sort of way. And so we gave them three options for that. Um, we did individual and group educator consultations a lot that year. And then the third and fourth year, we focused most of our energy in what we called the healing centered schools cohort. Um, that was open to all staff. I really, really want to emphasize that, that to, in order to have a trauma informed school, in order to be a healing centered space, everybody has to be at the table, right? It can't just be clinicians. It can't just be classroom teachers. Um, we included and invited admin, educators, paraprofessionals, our community partners who are running our after school program to participate. And that was a monthly deep dive into trauma informed practice. There was an annual full day workshop and they were paid. Um, I want to emphasize that as school health centers, um, when we're getting funding, additional funding for work like this, one of the most important things we can do is pay the people who are going to be putting the extra emotional labor and, and work in to changing school culture and climate. And so we paid educators to participate in that cohort and to do the extra work every month. Um, and we also continued our calm corners. So um, in the healing centered school cohort, this is kind of the model that we came up with that's been that worked for us. This was based off of a lot of conversations um, and a lot of surveys with teachers, with students um, and with admin. And this is the these are kind of the each month we took one of these topics to deep dive into and then to practice throughout the month and come back together. Um, another thing that's important to note is that in each of these, we also included vicarious trauma and staff wellness. If you'll notice, there's not a bullet point on here that says vicarious trauma and staff wellness um, because <laughs> vicarious trauma and staff wellness shouldn't be a one off situation right we shouldn't have one training. Um, at the beginning or end of the year and then say like good luck be well, um, and so what we did was we integrated that into each of our um, monthly sessions we spent about 30 minutes of each session just focused on um, our wellness, on connecting, on identifying in what ways trauma was impacting us and in what ways we could be responsive to that. Um, and so we moved from an introduction to trauma and healing centered practice down through you know, strategies for emotion regulation in all of the different tiers of PBIS, um, responding to high impact events the educators are actually the ones that changed that from crisis so we've been talking about crisis and there was a lot of conversation about well what what it what is considered a crisis um there's a lot of things that happen through the day that don't get coded as quote unquote crisis but that are um, high impact and impact educators and admin and students in our school campus and climate um we had some really um wonderful i can't recommend them highly enough um outside trainers who came in to help facilitate um, full day workshops on culturally responsive education. Their information is at the end of our slides as well. Um, we moved through kind of all of these strategies, talking about relationship building, um, interventions for the classroom, interventions and strategies for changing structure and policy, um, changing literal environmental design, and then creating sustainability. So really, um, 
leaning on the leaders that come out of this cohort to be strategizing and prioritizing for the following years. Nessa, you're on mute. So sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing about all of the wonderful work that you've done with our educators. Um, we're going to move on to some of the other groups we talked about uh, with community and students. But first, I'd like to include some more student voice um, in this. Uh, so this is an eighth grade student um, in Oakland. And again, um, ever since fourth grade, when I saw that guy get shot, I can't stay in one spot. I always have to move around because every day I'm on high alert. I check the corners and hallways at schools because I always think about the dangerous things that happen. I can't concentrate on things very long. It helps if they let me have a piece of paper to draw on. It also helps if I can chew gum or a toothpick. The best teachers I've had teach differently. Some teachers just talk a lot, but I usually zone out and start thinking about stuff in my neighborhood. I like experimenting and learning differently. I guess I'm used to moving around to stay safe. Um, and so community um, is huge in um, being able to build a trauma-informed um, school and community. Um, and so some of the things that uh, we've done are make it a priority to um, use some of the funding that we've had to implement programs that can sustain um, without the clinic's funding in the future. Um, and they just require a little bit of community involvement and support um, from our partners, families, um, and students. So some of those things include that we've created a satellite food pantry. Um, we started a program um, la this last year um, prior to COVID um, called Fam First Fridays, where every day um, that it wasn't raining, every first Friday of the month that it wasn't raining, we would have free coffee and complimentary tea out for families in the mornings as they drop their students off. Um, and we'd also bring some food bags out for folks in the community to pick up. Um, we also had a community warm up in the winter months, which was amazing. Um, we spent about a month um, allowing community members to drop off donations of warm clothing. And we ended up collecting, um, I think over 500 um, coats, sweaters, pants, and things like that. Uh, we were also in the process of organizing a health fair, which has been postponed, um, but that we were able to outreach to a ton of community partners who were interested in coming um, and engaging with our students. Um, so, um, we built a hub where community mem members could mingle and gain access to their basic needs. Um, this is super important because we were able to start creating a safe space. Um, as the student mentioned in their quote, um, the community can oftentimes be very unsafe. Um, and so schools, if we are able to use some of the space on campus to create a safe space where community members can come and students can come and everyone can mingle together without fear of something dangerous happening um, or um, seeing some sort of violence that is really helpful in people just sort of being able to relax um, and network with one another and talk. Um, and there's also a potential to grow out an entire framework of resources because everyone um, who's taking part and who's mingling with one another has something to offer. So it's just a really great um, thing to be able to share space with one another. Um, and these are some of our partners that we worked with in the last year. Um, I think it's really important to note that we also included other schools. Um, so there's uh, an elementary school just down the street from us. Uh, we often work with them and try to include them in things we're doing, such as the health fair. The Alameda County Food Bank is a huge one. They have allowed them, along with the East Bay Asian Youth Center, had allowed us to start our remote uh, pantry from the clinic. Um, there's a land trust that uh, was going to come to our health fair and talk about um, sustainability and working with the land, growing your own food, things like that. Um, and again, bringing folks from all over the community is really, really important in building a trauma-informed space because students start to see that there are adults um, everywhere in the community 
who they can be safe with, who are supporting them, um, and who care about them. And they also gain access to resources and opportunities in their community that are outside of school um, and that are also available to them that they might not otherwise have known of. Um, and then at the same time, it allows for the adults to network with one another. It allows them to build their own partnerships, share resources back and forth. Um, I think this has been really essential right now during COVID when we're all sort of virtual and online because we can rely on our community partners to share information about our agency. And then we can also return the favor and help them share information about the services they're providing and uh, the, the basic needs that they're providing to the community and that are available to students and family. Um, and so again, we've used social media. Um, something we've done or started to do is create social media pages for each of our school-based health centers. Um, and so using Instagram has definitely helped us to stay connected to um, a lot of these organizations and partners in the community. Um, and our patients can also, I mean, our patients are students, right? They're young people and they're all over social media. Um, so it's an easy way for them to be able to access, access these resources and services and also share the information um, with their friends. We've also used, um, some of the folks in our school-based health centers have used YouTube to create this really cool virtual tour of, um, of the open clinics that we have. And so since students, some students have never seen the inside of a school-based health center, they might be entering sixth grade or entering ninth grade. Um, and so we just thought it was a really cool way for them to get to experience the clinic, even though they don't physically have um, as much access to it right now. Um, so we're exploring that. Um, we're exploring Google Classrooms um, and just other interactive applications that um, help us to stay connected uh, with folks. Um, and then moving on to our students, um, of the three groups that we focused on, um, I'd say this is, uh, certainly one of the most important, um, I think this is the reason that we're all in the work together, um, and that we continue to problem solve, um, and strive to be the best we can is so that we are able to support our students. Um, and some more student voice. Uh, sometimes I'm so rude to my teachers, especially these two teachers who are actually really nice. A lot of times I don't know why I'm so disrespectful to them. It just happens. I wish my teachers would know that I've been through a lot of stuff and sometimes I say things, but it's not really about them. I've had a lot of adults who are supposed to take care of me come in and out of my life. So I guess I've learned to be rude because then when people leave me, at least I'm not um, too close to them. And that was shared by one of our seventh graders. Um, so the students are really the soul of our schools, right? They teach us how to be joyful every day and um, live in their truth, but have fun at the same time. And something that we learned is that um, we have to create spaces where these kids can have fun and just be kids. Um, they're, they're clearly like going through a lot. That's why we're here to provide them services to help support them get through those experiences. Um, and so being able to create some form of informal interaction between the students and the school staff and administrators, as well as the health center, um, helps to create new opportunities for connection and build trust um, between the students and adults, which is super, super uh, important. And so some of the outcomes, um, uh, that we've reached um, in our efforts to build a trauma-informed space are Wellness Wednesdays. So um, this past year, we were able to start doing Wellness Wednesdays. Every Wednesday, we would go out to, uh, the health center staff would go out to the blacktop at the school and um, encourage engagement with the kids. Uh, we would bring out our speaker. We had a playlist of kid-friendly music that we would play. We brought out um, some giant board games that uh, were supported through the funding. So we had like giant checkers, giant connect four, beanbag toss, um, chalk. We had student tables. So students were able to table about some of the stuff they were doing. And it just really created a nice environment for students to be able to have fun, 
um, and interact with the adults. So they would come and talk to us and kind of get to know us outside of the clinic, which was awesome. And I think also get to know their teachers outside of the classroom, which, which is super important um, in building relationships and trust. Um, and then we also, of course, offer trauma therapy. So we do individual therapy with our IBH as well as group therapy um, and use the CBITS model for that. Um, and so that, of course, is key and probably one of our most used services at the clinic, um, which is really amazing for students. Um, and then we also typically have a peer health education group um, where students can apply to be part of the program and they get to pick their own individual um, or as a group get to pick a project or a topic that's interesting to them and educate their, their peers about it, which is really great. Um, so last year, the topic that the students chose was mental health and they started something called a mental health ally project. And it was really awesome. They tabled at lunch, they talked at the assemblies and educated other students about mental health and self-care and what that looks like and what it means to support others um, mental health. And um, it was just really great. They were able to nominate allies across the school. So adults and students alike were, were both nominated and we were able to celebrate those over the morning announcements um, who was nominated um, and just make it really fun um, for the students to start thinking about these things and also to educate one another. Um, and then of course, um, with COVID-19 and the schools sort of getting shut down and us having to transition to distance learning and telehealth, we've tried to make some adaptations um, in the way we create trauma-informed space and how we're thinking about the students. Um, obviously, we don't have a physical space right now where we're able to do this work. And so that that's definitely challenging. Um, but some of the things that we are doing, I mentioned earlier, we're really trying to utilize social media. Um, and then we're continuing our mental health ally project virtually. So six of those students are um, working on how to create social media content that shares the same information um, and design t-shirts so that those can be mailed out to folks who were nominated as allies. Um, and then in advisory classes, we hope to sort of continue along with the um, idea of celebrating those individuals who are nominated. Um, and something else that is, is really cool that we've been working on is getting um, distance gifts out to some of our students and patients. So um, Sarah has worked a ton on this. Um, and essentially what we're doing is putting together little goodie bags uh, for students who are starting therapy and they include things like fidget toys, notebooks, pens, art supplies. Um, and we really just hope to connect, um, reconnect with our students in that way and let them know that we are still here and we are still uh, supporting their growth. Um, yeah, that, that has been really great. Um, and so now we left some time for our teachers. Um, it's lovely. We've been able to be joined by two of our teachers from Roosevelt, uh, Audrey and Whitney, and they have both um, transitioned from being in this healing center uh, schools cohort as participants to um, leading the cohort last year um, as the educators educating other educators. Um, and so I thought I'd share this, this wonderful quote um, that kind of sums up this. Uh, Trust between teachers and students is the effective glue that binds educational relationships together. Not trusting teachers has several consequences for students. They are unwilling to submit themselves to the perilous uncertainties of new learning. They avoid risk. They keep their most deeply felt concerns private. They view with cynical reserve the exhortations and instructions of teachers. Um, with that being said, I will let these ladies introduce themselves. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're really uh, happy to have you here and hear your insight. Thank you, Nessa. Um, I will moderate this part of it, but I would love for Whitney and Audrey if you want to briefly introduce yourselves. Um, yeah, so my name is Whitney Morrow. Um, this is my fifth year at Roosevelt Middle School. 
Um, I have a bachelor's in psychology and my master's is in urban education and literacy. Um, I teach eighth grade humanities, which I love eighth graders. I know eighth graders are scary to some, but they're my absolute favorite group in middle, in middle school. Um, I'm actually from Kansas City, um, and a fun fact about me is I played basketball in college. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, and then I help coach the basketball team, so. Um, and I'm Audrey. Uh, I teach seventh grade humanities. This is my seventh year at Roosevelt. Um, I started off as a, a special education teacher in the first four years, and then transitioned into the general education classroom, which has been really interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I am pretty well known for any time, like, like there's a call for costumes, I am on it. Like spirit week, Halloween, like if I could show up to school in a costume and embarrass myself and including all of the students I interact with, <laughs> it's like the best day for me. Um, yeah, I also, I also coach volleyball, which is awesome. And um, I've been an LGBTQ liaison for the school for about five years as well. Thank you all so much for being here. So let's just get started by um, asking, how do you define healing-centered schools? I can, I can start off. Um, so I think of that as like implementing trauma-informed practices in every space of the school. Um, and I think it also includes like a shift of seeing trauma and our students' experiences, um, not through like a deficit lens. Like I think, Sarah, you were saying like, all of these terrible things are happening to our students end of PD, like <laughs> it's just not helpful for teachers or students to just be given the information about like what's not going well. Um, I think healing centered schools uh, shift from that space into the belief that like through trusting relationships, um, through connection that schools can actually be a space for healing. Um, and healing is, is incredibly empowering to everybody involved. So that's how I think I would define that. Um, yeah, similar to Audrey, she kind of said everything that I was gonna say. Um, I guess, again, just the shift um, of, and the importance of not re-traumatizing students. I think in schools, historically, there's just been a lot of trauma on students caused from the school itself. Um, and so I think healing center schools really work to not only dismantle it, but not exacerbate trauma that students are already experiencing. Um, and that's the only thing I wanted to add. Like I said, she, she did the whole definition for me. Thank you so much for that. Um, and as we're going through this, I just want to remind folks that the Q&A is open to you. We'll, we'll leave some time at the end. If you have questions for any of us, um, drop them in the question and answer. Um, and we'll get to them right at the end. So um, can you both talk about what tools or strategies you've gained either through the, the Healing Centered Schools cohort or just in your practice that you use um, to create Healing Centered Classrooms? Yeah, I can start. Um, so aside from empathy, because I think anytime you talk about trauma, you have to talk about empathy. Um, I think one of the biggest things I've learned is just looking at a whole picture. Because again, a lot of times, especially with students who exhibit um, outward behaviors, we always like attach the kid to that behavior. Like they're the kid who's loud. They're the kid who gets in fights. And instead of looking again as a student as a whole, because um, I'll never forget my first year, I went to a volleyball game and I saw this girl I had in my class and it was like, it was beautiful to see her in just such a different environment. And I was like, wow, like I've never seen Whitney, I think you, your, your audio cut out. Am I, yeah, am I, I, no, there's something going on with the audio. Maybe Whitney can reconnect. Yeah, here we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. 
Okay. You cut yeah. out when you were talking about going to the volleyball game and seeing your student in a different environment. Okay, thank you. Um, but yeah, I saw her in a different environment and it was just very eye opening for me to like see her smile, see her laugh. And that like made me realize like these kids are not just their behaviors. They are so much more than that. And we as educators have to understand. And so that was something that I've definitely gained as well as like understanding my own trauma um, and my own experiences, you know, just being a woman, being a, a black woman. Um, I've experienced my own things, something similar to the kids, um, you know, like I've lost my father. So I think when you are working with kids who are experiencing trauma, you also have to, again, be able to look at yourself and understand what it is that you bring to the table and what are you bringing to the classroom every day. Um, and then as far as like tangible tools, I mean, we done calm corners, uh, strategies to understand when students are escalated just creating a preventative space because I think a lot of times in schools we're reactive and we like to react to behaviors and it's a lot of power in creating a space that's already safe. It's calm, it's inviting, it's welcoming. And I think that is kind of the shift that we as schools have to make is like do the base work so that we don't even create these issues and again, further exacerbate trauma in students. Um, and I think the last thing is meditation. That's been like, I started it last year and I started meditating every morning before class with the students. And that was a very powerful experience for me. Um, it kind of all helped us like get ready to learn, I guess you could say, so. Yeah, I just to kind of reiterate what Whitney said, I think what has been most powerful for me is, is looking at myself um, and uh, kind of taking a pause, thinking about how vicarious trauma shows up in me, both in the classroom and outside of it. Um, yeah, I, I think in our fast paced school day, oftentimes things will happen. And as teachers, we're like, move, move through it get to the next learning target, get to this, get to that. You're this, this far behind in days on your curriculum, but to normalize harm is, is re-traumatizing. So I think this cohort um, has just taught me to pause, <laughs> to pause for a minute. And the, I think Whitney kind of spoke to like how just taking a breath can be so healing. Just even a, a single minute or a single breath can bring um, the stress level down. Um, yeah, I agree with the, the physical and emotional space that you provide a student can either be re-traumatizing or it can facilitate joy and, and play and, and healing. And I think teachers, especially right now, we can feel quite powerless that the weight of the world is on our shoulders. Um, but if, if we kind of concentrate on building those connections and those relationships and we're focused on healing as opposed to like all the other things, it can, it can be um, really helpful for a, a teaching practice and just being a human being. Yeah, thank you. What advice would you have for others? So, you know, the, the folks on this, the attendees are often are mostly here from health centers. So what advice do you have for other health centers who are working with teachers to implement trauma-informed resilience strategies in their classrooms or in their schools? Um, one piece of advice I have is to understand, assume best intent. Um, I know that's easier said than done, but again, we have to assume that people have their best interests at heart. Um, and then with that said, understand that every teacher comes from a different background. We're all starting at different places. And so sometimes I think we assume that people know, you know, basic psychology principles, or we assume that, you know, all teachers follow a certain model. Um, and that's not true. Um, everyone has their own separate experiences. So I think Part of it again is kind of, you do have to start from the beginning, even if it's like retraining for teachers like me who've gone through extensive training, I think it's really important to, um, again, 
give teachers that opportunity to start fresh. I think another thing too is um, for teachers to, I guess for schools to realize too, like you can't just give it to us one day. We have a lot going on. We're trying to lesson plan, we're trying to grade. And as they said, like, you can't just give one training, we signed our paper, okay, we got our PD. Like, no, we have to do this on a regular basis. And it starts at the top, because I think that's one of the things that a lot of schools leave out is if the administrators are not on board, then it's just not going to work at your school. So everyone really kind of has to buy in to this idea about healing center. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I so, so agree with that. Um, I would say like coming from a health center standpoint, if I were to try to, and sell this to teachers, um, I would say you don't have to choose between classroom management and trauma-informed practices. They're actually one and the same. I think that we, we have like this, <laughs> we present kind of this dichotomy of like, the crunchy granola teacher who you know has like a weighted blanket and then like the old school like super harsh but we're not like none of us are actually either of those two things you know like um being a trauma-informed teacher does not mean you're not holding kids accountable it doesn't mean that your expectations are going down um it's actually to me the exact opposite um and i would say like if if teachers aren't ready, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't force them to buy in because I, I just think this deserves a lot of attention. Um, and it's a lot of inner work as well. So if teachers aren't, aren't bought into it, I wouldn't make it like a required, a required PD. What I really appreciated about Sarah was that she gave choice. Um, and when you present to teachers, like learn about how like you can manage your your stress and you don't have to do anything <laughs> like you don't have to do a graphic organizer or create a slide or anything like that i think teachers can get on board with that so yeah uh coming from a health center standpoint i would just let teachers know that this you, you can make trauma-informed teaching work for you in a way and make it genuine for you because if it's not genuine then it's not going to work, especially in middle school. They see right, like right through it. So. Yeah, thank you. OK. Um, um, having participated in healing centered school cohort work and an ongoing um, related work on campus, what changes, if any, have you seen in your classrooms or in the hallways um, at Rosebell? So, I, so for me, the thing that came up immediately was um, I've written a lot of behavior intervention plans in my day. Um, and what came up was like a BIP doesn't really mean anything unless the relationship is there. Like you can go through those four steps in the IEP, but unless that student, that young person has a relationship with you, there. It, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So I would say like since the implementation of like calm corners and, um, and trauma-informed strategies, I, I've noticed that even when kids are in like a, a trauma space, they don't feel like they have to leave my classroom in order to get what they need. So like with a, with a calm corner, I'm, I keep thinking like, wow, what would I do without this space with this cry? Like if I had a crying child, um, would I then ask that crying child who's probably really embarrassed to go stand out in the hallway? No, I have this like dedicated space, this calm corner. And it's like both a physical and metaphorical demonstration that I, I and our classroom can hold everything that you're feeling can hold everything that you are in this space. And I think that's extremely affirming to a student who has, who's in a, who is in a trauma space. Yeah, thank you, Audrey, for um, bringing up the sending kids out, because I know that that's sometimes the easiest thing to do is just 
get out. <laughs> um, and again, in my first year, um, that was something I didn't ever do it, but that was always something I tried to rely on, I guess you could say. Um, and after this training, I've really learned that again, I, I'm the adult. And so I need to figure out again, what is it that this kid needs that I'm not able to provide them? Um, what did, what did I do to cause like, or to play into this situation? And it's sometimes it's hard to look at yourself and see how, um, your own actions could potentially be, um, not necessarily traumatizing a student, but triggering for a student, whether it's intentional or not. I know there's been some students that, you know, women are just triggering to them. And I had to realize that and not learn to take it personal. Um, and again, create those boundaries. Um, and then as Audrey mentioned, just having that relationship, because then when you build that relationship, you can understand those, you can understand that. Like this kid has issues with women because I've taken the time to get to know him. And now I understand where this is all coming from. And now I kind of have a better idea. Now I know what it is that he needs. Some kids do want to go out in the hallway, get a drink of water. Some kids want to sit in the calm corner and relax. Um, but I think giving them that option and that flexibility to not always like, again, have to leave our learning environment and know that you have it all here with me. Um, and again, I'm here to help you. I'm here to support you. Um, and I think that has really helped me in the classroom. Yeah, thank you so much for speaking to that, particularly about having students leaving. A lot of times our interventions have been to exclude children from classrooms in order to get what they need. And I love that you are both doing it in your classrooms. Um, that really takes us and I think links really well to how does this work coincide with the current social political climate that we're in right now and the landscape that we're in right now? Um, for me, um, again, just being black and seeing constant black people be killed and not only killed, but on camera has been very traumatizing for me in itself because that's, um, yeah, it's just, it, I'm not desensitized to it in any way. I'm, I'm actually, like I said, it, when I see it, it, it makes me upset. It hurts. And so I feel like that just always gives me the push to advocate for our students. And um, in particular for black students, because typically black students are the ones who are considered to have an attitude. Black students are the ones who are suspended more than other groups of students are expelled, even at Roosevelt. Um, and Black students don't make up a majority of students at the school, and yet somehow the data has shown that Black students are suspended more. Um, and so I think it has, again, gave me focus um, and just more intention behind my actions and making sure I'm an advocate for um, our kids. Like, for example, we've started a Black girls group um, because we've felt like there's really like a space missing for our African-American females to just again, connect and kind of talk about the different things that we're going through. Um, and so that has... Oh no, Whitney, we can't hear you again. But I, I, I'm like... <laughs> no. I'm usually... Wait, here we are, you're back, you're back. <laughs> Um, I have no idea where I left off. I am so sorry. You were just talking uh, about the Black um, Girls group and the importance of that. Yeah, so again, I think um, I was just saying that that has been like a way to kind of, again, dismantle this racist system that we're having to exist in. And so that has been a way for me to, again, instill these things into the kids that they may not necessarily get from home, that they may see on social media, um, and start them young. Because I think a lot of times we wait till we're adults to try to do all this deep thinking and inner work. And I feel like you should start this at this age, because they're becoming and they're learning more about themselves. So this is the perfect time for them to understand who they are and to, you know, help form their identity um, and what they bring to this world, because I think that's also very important. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, thank you so much, Whitney. Uh, 
thank you. I really appreciate that so much. Um, so I, I think of this as twofold. So like we're in a pandemic <laughs> and I think like we're all in a trauma space right now and taking on new things is so difficult and can cause students to um, just, you know, either give up or, or want to fight, like fight, flight, freeze. Um, but they don't have anywhere to go sometimes. So it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, I am also thinking increasingly more and more that teacher neutrality should not be a thing. <laughs> Teacher neutrality in our current political climate cannot exist, especially when we have what is 78% of our teachers are white and many of our students are facing racial trauma. Um, and I think part of building trust is letting young people know who you are and what you stand for. And I believe that teacher neutrality is there for stifling those relationships that could potentially be healing. Because in, in my work with the LGBTQ liaisons, like I found that like kids, kids don't assume, they don't assume that you respect them or see them. They do not assume because you're in a position of power that they can trust you. So I, that's just to say like my, my students don't assume that I believe Black Lives Matter until I say it, until I make it known. They don't assume that I think that trans students deserves more, deserve more until I say it. And so teacher neutrality, I'm just not, I'm distancing myself more and more. Not that I was ever down with it. Um, but I mean, I grew up in Fresno. Um, where a district demands teacher neutrality. And I, I just think that should really truly end because if you're not seeing um, a black child's experience in our current revolution that's happening, you're not seeing them. You are not seeing them and you can't produce a relationship from that because there's no trust. You don't see them, you don't see their experiences. So um, I think there has to be a willingness to listen, to empathize, and to see experiences beyond your own right now. And um, yeah, it worries me. It worries me because there are so many people who look exactly like me who are creating these harmful, oppressive policies. And um, our students are walking into classrooms that are largely led by white teachers. So teacher neutrality should end. <laughs> Thank, thank you both. Um, it looks like we're getting, we only have a few minutes left for some questions. It looks like um, there's a few in here that we can actually answer. We'll make sure to get you an answer if you don't get one in this. Um, but I'll just ask really briefly if one of you could share um, what you have in your comm corner and how students access it. Like, do you have to refer them there? Um, do they self choose to be there? How does the comm corner work? Yeah, so some kids, um, some teachers make a pass. I do like a nonverbal signal, um, like one student, like they do a peace sign. I also have like little sheets of paper that they can take and just uh, leave at their desk. So it's visible to me. Um, but typically the comm corner loses its like, its um, appeal like not every kid wants to be there every minute after about the first week and like the kids understand that it's a space for when feelings start to arise um so typically i, I don't have to do a whole lot to manage it after the first week or so um i have a um art supplies i have a weighted blanket i have like soft uh, stuffed animals um, I have a little sound machine in there and I have a book called the Sloths, Sloth Mindfulness book. I can't remember the title, but it's adorable and the kids love it. <laughs> as well as breathing practices. Um, Sarah, with time, you can go ahead and move on to the next question. Sure, um, I think that the well, it's more like comment slash questions around 
around buy-in. Um, and I, I think I want to just speak to that. You know, I saw a couple of comments in here about like, yes, definitely like you need teacher buy-in and sometimes it just doesn't work if you have buy-in. And I want to say yes and like yes to what everything to everything that's what said and also we can't leave those teachers out right like just because someone doesn't buy in doesn't mean we then exclude them from the work it means that they're in a different place in their learning in the same way that if we have a. You know, those of you who are familiar with motivational interviewing, we might have a young person who's like really ready for action like they're really ready to change something we might have a student who doesn't even know there's a problem we don't leave yeah. the student who knows there's a problem alone to just like figure it out on their own. Um, and so I'll just say from a health center standpoint, you know, some of the work I was doing, it was like really visible, the cohort and the, the breakfast and stuff. But I also did work that was not so visible with the teachers and the educators and the admin who are not necessarily quote unquote bought in. Um, and I really want to make sure that we're not just labeling people as like, okay, well, those people are resistant. Those people don't want to change. And so like those people over here and we're over here making progress and like, we're just going to go without you our whole community has to be on the ride together. Um, and so building relationships with the teachers and the admin and the support staff who aren't bought in is also super important. And that looked like stopping into a classroom, making someone a cup of coffee, saying like, wow, you've been here for 30 years. Like, what's that been like? Um, what kind of change have you seen? Really getting to understand their perspective. Um, and that doesn't mean that they sign up for all of my trainings, but it does mean that sometimes they call me on the phone and ask me for advice, even they, though they don't want anyone to know that they did it, right? <laughs> so <laughs> we also have to make sure we're not leaving folks behind <laughs> when we're getting on this train. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we're actually running, we're out of time. We've run to time. Um, it looks like we've gotten most of the questions answered. Um, and if there's a question in here that's not answered, we can definitely get to you afterwards. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, and yeah, we'll be around in the conference, you can um, send messages to Vanessa and I. Yes, uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I hope there's something that you can take away from this presentation. And again, like Sarah said, please feel free to connect with us, send us questions, um, and we will get back to you on those. Thank you so much for joining us today.